Hi, I'm David Berlin, Editor-in-Chief with Programmable Web, and I'm here with the second part of our 11-part video series on APIs 101. The series is designed for those of you who are just hearing about APIs and want to get smart enough about them so that you can talk about them or hold a conversation. This is beginner to intermediate level. We don't do a real serious technical deep dive or cover all of the technical details, but we give you just enough to get smart about them. So just again to review what the series is covering in a broad brush, we're talking about what exactly an API is, how do they work, we're talking about why it is you should invest in an API program, whether you're a developer or an API provider, how to productize APIs, very important issue, you want to treat them like products, how to secure them because generally speaking APIs go on the internet and internet security is very important for everybody. Why API-first design is so important. API-first design is a methodology towards building the best APIs so that developers will really love using them. And finally, lastly, we're going to put our hands on and get some real examples of how to build APIs and then how to consume them. So this is part two. If you haven't seen part one, make sure you go back and watch this because we build on some concepts that we established there. One of those concepts was how we talked about how the API is a user interface, it's just a little bit different from the user interface that we're all used to using. For example, the one on our smartphone looks like this, right? We all know what to do with this. We can see it, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can look, use the menus. We have an expectation of how it works. Our brains know how to work with this. Well, machines need their own interface. They don't have brains, they don't have fingers, they don't have eyes. They need their own understanding of how to talk to each other. That understanding is what we call a contract. We talked about that in part one of the series. And in this part, we're going to talk a little bit more about the different analogies in the real world that look just like an API contract. And those analogies are going to be using a wall socket, using Lego, and then using what we call the intermodal shipping container, which all of you may have seen on cargo ships or on rail cars or on the back of tractor trailer trucks. So let's talk about the contract that exists with a wall socket. A wall socket is a really good example of where there are consumers of the service and providers of the service, just like with APIs, consumers and providers. We talked about that in part one of this video series. The consumer, of course, is device. Could be a computer, could be a hairdryer, could be a television. The provider is your electric utility. And the wall socket is a really good example of where the interface is so that the two can work with each other the very basic but exact technical understanding. You've got a specific arrangement of the receptacles in the wall socket, the tall receptacle is for neutral, the short one's for hot, the semi-ovular one is for the ground, it delivers 120 volts of alternating current as opposed to direct current, and those different holes are a very specific distance apart from one another. So there is very, there's a very clear contract here that exists so that no matter what it is that you have, you can plug it into the wall and it really doesn't know what's providing the electricity just so long as that thing that's providing the electricity also adheres to this particular contract. Another great example is Lego. We've all played with it, we have kids that play with it, and in order for Lego to snap to each other, you need to have a very exact understanding of the dimensions of the different stubs and nubs on the Legos and how they fit together. The consumer may be the one that goes on top and the provider may be the one that goes on the bottom, but at the end of the day, there's a technical contract that exists between all Lego pieces. Now my favorite is the intermodal shipping container developed by a guy named Malcolm McLean who's considered to be the father of modern day shipping logistics, right? So he looked back at this a long, uh, long time ago in the, in the middle of the 20th century and he said, boy, this is really inefficient for us to be hand loading cargo onto a ship and then unloading it by hand on the other end and splitting it up and figuring out, well, which goes to that store and which goes to that recipi recipient. He came up with a much better way called the intermodal shipping container. And the idea behind that is to say, okay, we're going to take all these goods, we're going to put them in a shipping container, then we're going to put them on a truck, we're going to drive that truck to the rail station, we're going to put it on a rail, uh, on a rail car, that rail car is going to go to the shipping yard, and then we're going to put it on a cargo ship, we're going to ship it, and on the other end, that same process is going to go in reverse until the cargo container arrives at the recipient's location and they unload it. You can imagine how compared to the old way of just hand loading all the different cargo, it was way more of an efficient process. Well, he came up with this whole idea and it's very much based on a contract that it happens where these containers connect to everything, to each other, to rail cars, to tractor trailer trucks, or even to uh, the, the cargo ships. So for example, if you look here, you can see that uh, on all four corners of the container, there's a, what's called a twist lock receptacle, and then you've got the actual twist lock 
uh, assembly. And these have very specific dimensions to them so they all can fit together almost like Lego fits together. And these dimensions are really well understood whether it be just the containers themselves, the cargo ships, the rail cars, or the tractor trailer trucks. So the example of the contract here again, is the size of the cargo container, 40 feet by 8 foot 6 by 8, the twist lock casting which appears on all eight corners of the shipping container, and then the assemblies which can be single sided, double sided, trailer mounted, rail mounted, cargo ship mounted, doesn't matter. They all understand this and then you add, again have this idea of a provider and a consumer. The provider is the provider of the transportation, the rail car, the cargo ship, the tractor trailer truck, and the consumer of that is the container. So think about it. What out there in the real world is another analogy for this sort of contract that exists between a consumer and a provider or something? We're literally surrounded by thousands of these analogies. We see them every single day. So stop and think about it in your mind so that when you're having that conversation with somebody and you're trying to explain APIs to them, pick something that you understand really well and describe the contract to them so that they get it. There's so many of these analogies out there, you just have to pick one. So that's the end of this second part of our 11 part series. In the next part, we're going to talk about how this contract delivers an amazing amount of flexibility to the organizations that put it to use. And this is a slide that you'll see in part three of our series. So be sure to join us in that part. Thank you very much.